naciones unidas te ofrecemos nuestra adoración you remember this song we sing one kingdom sing with us the best you can English and Spanish we go Naciones Unidas Lord, we worship you around your throne The nations together Te ofrecemos nuestra adoración Cada pueblo And so again, I asked God for signs. Give me a sign. And, and for the life of me, I can't remember exactly what I asked. I don't remember what the signs were, but I know that they were small little things. And I really couldn't figure out if it was just a coincidence that what I asked would happen or if not. Because sometimes I would ask for a sign and, and sometimes it would look like it went my way. That yes, he, he would be with me in that. And then other times, I didn't get the same answer, and so I was confused, and I know that that's not unique to me, that we've all, whether we're currently in that situation or not, been in situations where we want to find out what is God's will, or what is God saying, or what direction should I go, that we're desperate to hear God's voice. And so today I want to talk about how do we recognize or hear God's voice. Mm -hmm. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Judges, the sixth chapter. We're going to begin in verse one. Mm -hmm. In verse one, it says, The people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord gave them into the hand of Midian, of Midian seven years. And the hand of Midian overpowered Israel. And because of Midian, the people of Israel made themselves dens that are in the mountains and the caves and the strongholds. For whenever the Israelites planted crops, the Midianites and the Amalekites and the people of the east would come up against them. They would encamp against them and devour the produce of the land as far as Gaza and leave no sustenance in Israel and no sheep or ox or donkey. In verse 5 it says, For they would come up with their livestock and their tents, and they would come like locusts in number. Both they and their camels could not be counted, so that they laid waste as they came in. And Israel was brought very low because of Midian. And the people of Israel cried out for help to the Lord. Verse 7 says, When the, the people of Israel cried out to the Lord on account of the Midianites, the Lord sent a prophet to the people of Israel. And he said to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I led you up from Egypt and brought you out of the house of slavery, and I delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the land and from the hand of all who oppressed you and drove them out before you and gave you their land. And I said to you, I am the Lord your God. You shall not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but you have not obey my voice. And so, of course, the book of Judges is a book of, of Judges, and, and, it, and it repeats the cycle not only in the book of Judges, but throughout the history of the Israelites. Where, where the Israelites would, would cry out to help, and, and God would send a judge to save them. And, and the Israelites would repent. And then the Israelites will again sin. Mm -hmm. 
And so they repeat this cycle. And so here they are in this cycle once again where they have disobeyed, uh, that they didn't listen to the judge, that, that after the judge left, died, they fell back into their regular pattern of sinning. And now they reap the consequences of this by not obeying God. And they are oppressed. And, and it gets to a point where they're so uncomfortable that they again cry out to the Lord. And so he sends this unnamed prophet to rebuke them. And I'm going to continue in verse 11. And it says, Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth at Ophrah, which belonged to Joaz the Abbey, right? While son Gideon was bearing out wheat in the prime wine press to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you. O mighty man of battle. And Gideon said to him, Please, sir, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his wonderful deeds that our father recounted to us, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? And now the Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hands of Midian. And the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do not I send you? And he said to him, Please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, But I will be with you, and you shall strike the Midianites as one man. And I know this is a lot of scripture, but please bear with me, because there, I believe, is a profound point in it. And we'll continue in verse 17. And he said to him, If now I have found favor in your eyes, then show me a sign that it is you who speak with me. Please do not depart from here until I come to you and bring you out my present and set it before you. And he said, I will stay till you return. Verse 19, so Gideon went into his house and prepared a young goat and 11 cakes from an ephah of flour. The meat he put in a basket and the broth he put in a pot and brought them to him under the terebinth and presented them. And the angel of the Lord said to him, Take the meat and the eleven cakes and put them on this rock and pour the broth over them. And he did so, and the angel of the Lord reached out the tip of the staff that was in his head and touched the meat and the eleven cakes. And fire sprang up from the rock and consumed the meat and the eleven cakes. And the angel of the Lord vanished from his sight. And then verse 22, it says, Then Gideon perceived that he was an angel of the Lord. And Gideon said, Alas, O God, for now I have seen the face of the Lord, the angel of the Lord face to face. And so here we have it that, that the angel of the Lord comes to Gideon. And through Gideon, he tells him that I'm going to use you to save the the Israelites, that you're going to be the next judge, essentially. And here, Gideon, he's saying, like, how do I know? And so this brings us to our first point in the answer, how, or really the main point in the answer, how do we know God's voice? And how can we discern God's voice? And the simple answer to that is by experience. So we cannot know God's voice if we have not experienced him. Amen. And so take note that in the beginning of these scriptures that Gideon says, you know, where are all these things that our fathers recounted to us? Where are all those words? Where are all the things that our father has said that he would do for us? And, and to me, it's all talk because I haven't experienced it. What I'm experiencing now. It's being oppressed. What I'm experiencing now is hardship, and I don't know the things that my fathers and others that are older have spoken on. And so very simply put that Gideon could not discern the voice of God simply because he did not know God. So again, if we want to know God's voice, we've got to experience him. We've got to know him. So of course, I'm a twin. And I, I'm an identical twin, so I know Paige very well. And so Paige was walking from a distance, and, and I, she was too far away for me to see her face. 
I would know that she was approaching me just by the way that she walked. Mm -hmm. If she's walking up the steps, I can tell it's her rather over my mother or another family member or a friend because I know pain. And so it's the same thing that you cannot know someone if you are not in relationship with him. Amen. And so if we want to discern God's voice, we have to experience him. And so it continues that, that God tells Gideon to go and tell down the, his father's altar of Baal. And so he goes and he does it, and he does it at night because he's afraid of, of the man in the town. And, and so he does it at night, and he does it. And, and they want to kill him the next morning, but his father comes into his defense and says, hey, let's. Baal contend for himself. If he's really a God, let him contend for himself. Let him deal with Gideon. And so he's able to go through that, and, and God delivers him through that, and God is with him through that. And then God is with him where he mobilizes an army, and he calls, calls other people to be with him, and, and he's able to mobilize the army. And so we see that God is with him. But as we continue on, we see that in verse 36, that God, that Gideon again asked God for two signs. In verse 36, it says, Then Gideon said to God, If you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said, behold, I am laying a fleece of wool on the dressing floor. If there is dew on the fleece alone, and it is dry on the ground, then I shall know that you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said. And it was so. When he rose early the next morning and squeezed the fleece, he wrung it enough dew from the fleece to fill a bowl with water. Then Gideon said to God, let not your anger burn against me. Let me speak just once more. Let, the, let me test just once more with the fleece. Please let it be dry on the fleece only, and on the ground let there be dew. And God did so that night, and it was dry on the fleece only, and on all the ground there was dew. And so we see that that Gideon's questioning moves from, is this really God? Is this really the voice of God? How do I know who I'm speaking to? To really questions of security. That, that how do I know that you're going to save Israel by my hand? As you said, how do I know that you're going to keep me safe? How, how do I know that you're really going to be there? And I believe that sometimes we can't discern God's voice, not because we don't know him, not because he's silent. And sometimes he is silent. Sometimes he has us wait, but sometimes we can't discern God's voice or we become confused, not because of any of those. But sometimes we become confused and our vision is clouded simply because there's questions of security. Are you really who you say you are? Will you really deliver me? If we look earlier at, at chapter 6, Gideon says, hey, look, I, my clan is the weakest in Manessa and I'm the weakest in my clan. But to my knowledge, at least, Scripture never verifies this. So he's the weakest, but says who? And so sometimes we can't, we become confused, not because the word wasn't clear, not because whether it's something that God has said in his word or something that he said uniquely to us, not because God was confusing or God wasn't clear, but because our baggage or our opinions of ourselves and the lies that we believe from Satan about ourselves or the risk of the circumstances causes us to doubt because we think, well, I hear God saying that I need to do this and on one hand, I know that it's God, but I also know my own limitations and I know that I'm weak and I know how risky this is and I know how unlikely this is. 
and, and I'm concerned that people will laugh about at me and people will talk about me and, and this is hard or maybe I stepped on, on faith and, and I did it and everything was fine but it's taken longer than what I thought it would take or it's much harder than what I thought it would be and, and I'm encountering obstacles that I didn't think that I would have and so now I'm wondering, did I make a mistake? Did God really say that I was to do this? And it's not because he wasn't clear. It's because there's this conflict that there's some things held in tension. And, and we, and, you know, we have to see God outside of our box and outside of our own limitations. Yes. And so now we are confused. But Amen. the reality is, is that we're not confused. Mm -hmm. We're afraid. Amen. Amen. And so in order to, to really hear God's voice clearly, First, we've got to know God. We've got to experience God. And so how, how do we experience God? If you want to experience God, then we must obey God. Amen. That we have to surrender and we have to go on a journey with God. And sometimes that means stepping out when we're not sure. I think sometimes we can be very rigid. And, and we can need, need to know what God is saying exactly. And, and feel like we need to have God plan every aspect of our lives. And while God has a plan for our lives and a detailed plan, it doesn't mean that God doesn't leave any room for preference. And it, and it doesn't mean that he leaves any room for us to move. And it also doesn't mean that we have to wait until we are absolutely sure to move. So we can look at God's word and know that he's the good shepherd and that he's going to keep us. And if I mess up, then there's some blessings in this and that he will guide me on the right path. And so I don't know what to do but to figure out and so that I have some experience so that I can know what does God's conviction feels like rather than condemnation feels like. Then I'm going to step out on faith and I'm going to experience God. I'm going to go on a journey with God. I'm going to walk with God. And by walking with God, by getting to know God, then I know his voice. And I get to know when I'm speaking to myself, when Satan is speaking to me, or when God is speaking to me. And so, again, if you want to know God, we've got to experience God. And we experience God by being obedient to God Amen. and walking with God Amen. and journeying with God. And then the other half, when, when we start to get confused because the circumstance doesn't seem that it's going to go in our favor and we're well aware of our own limitations or, or we feel inadequate whether it's very real or it's just a perception. How we get around that is we just take God at his word that we don't sum things up in our own experience and our own strength as Gideon was because the fact of the matter is that Gideon never really got it right. Yes, he went out and, and, and they fought the battle and, and they won and God showed his power. But he never got it right that he eventually led Israel to sin and, and they repeated that cycle over and over again because he never really went on a journey with God. He, he basically kind of used them for his own benefit that, or he, he went and he stopped. He never fully went. He never fully surrendered. Everything was about his own strength and, and can I really do it? But he didn't take the time to really surrender. So if we want to get, have some clarity about what is God saying to us versus what I'm saying or what Satan is saying to me, then I need to really focus on God's power, mm -hmm. not my own strength. Because it really doesn't matter right. if I'm weak. It doesn't matter if I'm the weakest, if in fact he was the weakest. It doesn't matter what my limitations are. It doesn't matter how I failed in the past or what I've done in the past. Um, it doesn't matter what other people have said to me or who other people think I am. It, it matters who is God. Amen. Amen. And, and, and if God is all powerful, then, then this is like God batting his eyes that no matter the circumstance, this is easy for God. It may be hard for me, mm -hmm. but it's easy for God. And so I just want to challenge you, what would, how much easier would your life be or certain problems be where you could clearly discern when God was speaking. 
and when he wasn't. Because again, there's some situations where God isn't deciding. And we just need to wait. But sometimes we confuse, like, I don't know if I should wait or if I, I should go. And how much easier would, because life is hard and enough, the, the problems themselves are hard, but how much heartache or trouble could we avoid if we knew when to wait and when to move it? And even if we, wasn't, we weren't too sure on that, that we had peace in knowing that if I move or if I wait and I do it in faith, that God will be with me. So while I want to challenge you to go deeper in your relationship with God, to journey, to do what's uncomfortable, to do even what will make you look foolish, to do what feels unsafe and, and scary, and experience God, and, and to allow God to, to, to open up the box that we put him in. Amen. And I also wanted to encourage you to measure up your problem to God. Because again, he's not created us to function in our own power. But it, we're created to function in his strength. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I ask that you would be with us. We know that we are willing, but in our own strength, we're not able to do it. And I know all the time that, that, that you're showing us things, that you're speaking in. It may not be on the things that we want to hear, Lord, but you're moving in our lives. And, and, and you're pruning us and you're challenging us and, and you're causing us to grow. And so you're constantly speaking to us. And so I'm asking that you would give us the strength to wait, to, to be still and to listen. And that you would cancel out all the noise, all the lies, all the baggage that we have, everything that clouds our vision, that makes us confused, Lord. That you would allow us to see things clearly. And I know that we won't always see things clearly. And that's okay because you always see things clearly. And so I'm asking even in that, that you would guide us with footsteps. Even when we may veer off your path. Whether we know that we're there or, or, or we don't. I'm asking that you would be the good shepherd, Lord, and that you would guide us and that you would lead us and show us your way, Lord. But I'm asking most importantly that we would experience you, Lord. Let you be the prize, not the outcome of a certain situation or of the problems that we face, but Lord, help us to focus on you. I'm asking that more than than money, than, than security, than, than relationships or anything, any earthly thing, Lord, that we would desire you and that we would seek after you, that you would be the prize, that you would be the thing that we're running for, that our relationship with you, Lord. You know what our issues are, you know what our fears are, and so I'm asking that you step in. And while you're doing that, that you would give us peace, and not peace in a certain outcome, Lord, but peace knowing that in the end, Lord, that you win, and that in the end, we'll be with you 